thank you, Safas, for the opportunity. I hope I'm uh, clear enough. So I was they reached out to me to talk on dealing with the aliens within, meaning the insider threats. And like Safa said, I'm Fides Nyamuhanga. I come from Kenya and Africa, and I'm a manager, manager security services in Safaricom. So to start us off, I have uh, 30 minutes, so I'll try to be fast. We just want to start off with under, being prudent in understanding the difference between these terms, data privacy, data security, and data protection. So data privacy is basically the protection laws, the data protection laws and data regulations that govern the proper practices to collect, process, share, archive, and delete data. So like my, the previous presenter said, this data can be your employee data, it can be your the clients or the customers you're interacting with. It can be also the offline data where you get to sign data when you enter a building, you have to do your ID number, your phone number. Data security is uh, the internal controls an organization sets in place to protect data from compromise by unauthorized or malicious third party. And when you merge these two, then we get to have the data protection where uh, now you develop as an organization the processes to safeguard this important information that you've collected either online or offline from corruption, compromise, or loss. Another thing about data protection is that it is important because, <clears throat> because as the amount of data increase, as the organization grows, um, the data created and stored, it continues to grow at an unprecedented rate. So it's very important that you have this data protection, right? And that's where you get that uh, these laws like the Data Protection Act for Kenya comes up, which is based on the baseline of the GDPR law that is global. On my next slide, I'll just talk about the insider threat, what it is. Uh, an insider threat, these are human errors or disgruntled employee who want to just cause harm on the data that the organization is handling, collecting, processing. And uh, it adds up to just being, uh, it just adds up to misconduct of both the person handling the data and also the person who collected the data in terms of what processes they do not follow to ensure it's secure. On uh, statistics, on the insider threat to data privacy, all these are picked from reports that are shared there online. None of this is my own personal research. So in recent survey, uh, most MS, MSPs reported that uh, certain industries saw a rise in attack during the pandemic. You'd see that the healthcare saw a 59% increase in attack in their systems. Finance and insurance saw 50% increase in attacks, and the government saw 45% increase in attack. And most of this attack happened during the COVID-19 pandemic last year to this year, 2021. Also, reports predict that employees fears, employees, the contractors, fears around job laws, paired with is that data can be moved around since they are working from home, email, network attachment storage, uh, USBs are the results that could, are increasing the insider incidents. Another report from Forrester also highlighted the three major factors contributing to an increase in insider threat is the rapid push of users, including some outside of our organizations who typically to work remotely and the controls have not been put in place. So you find that employees, in the, the insecurity of the devices the employees are using goes up and also stealing and exfiltrating of the organization data also becomes easier because there are no controls in place. The pandemic was here. And so what do people do work from home? And with that, you find that most of this data is left, is left out unprotected meaning in terms of exfiltrating the data by either a disgruntled employee or even a human error is likely. Another thing is uh, realize that it's important that organization uh, prioritize insider threat defense while also being careful not to diminish employee privacy. 
meaning as much as you want to protect the data, you ensure that the privacy of the employee is still maintained and also the user experience when they are interacting with the system and the, and the data that, the system that hold the data is also not diminished. We also see that uh, considerations of employee privacy should be put in place. Uh, you can come up with a company culture where you tell your employees exactly what the company stands for. If it's transparency, you're transparent about the activities you're doing around uh, privacy of both the employee and the data that you're collecting if they're using work applications. Also, if, it's cult if you have a culture of trust where an employee, apart from having these controls in place, the culture of trust is instilled in them where they know exactly what they're supposed to do and what not to do when it comes to handling, transferring, sharing of data. Also, another thing we also, companies should consider the local standards for lawful, fair and acceptable labor practices so that your employees don't feel like they are working in a prison just to ensure that you're protecting data. So all these things put in place, culture, being transparent, being honest about what you're doing and just have those constant communication and participation with your employees, with your contractors, the third parties, also the public is important. One thing we also know uh, is that you can't completely uh, eliminate the risk posed by inside the threats in cyber security, but you can reduce the chances of these breaches and the potential damage that can be caused. But you have to be willing to make security a priority. And when we say security, it's data security. So also other things we notice that this risk come from various levels. They come from higher level employees, which are our management, the executive, they travel and crisscross the globe. So meaning they move to different countries, they access different internet service providers. We also have low level employees. We have the regular staff members. We have the third party service providers who are spread across the globe, depending on the organization tire you are in. So it is very prudent that you understand your organization, what kind of data they're interacting with, at what scale, locally and globally, who are those service providers they're interacting with so that you can be able to understand these insider threats, where do they come from? So according to a survey done by Threat Reports, uh, by Cyber Security Insider, Insiders, it says that 68% of organizations feel moderately to extremely vulnerable to insider attacks, meaning it's no longer about uh, a hacker out there who's trying to infiltrate the network, the network, but it's more about the people in your home who know what you do day in, day out, who know what the data you're collecting, who know what are your crown jewels. Also, according to an industry analyst firm, Forrester, citing the persistence of remote working, it predicts that internal incidents will be responsible for 33% of breaches in 2021. So this comes third to, comes close to ransomware, which has been, and malware, which has been the top, uh, in cyber security incident. Also, we have so many surveys. Uh, uh, according to Dell study, with the services that 59% of managers are one of the biggest insider threats in cyber security. Why a manager a manager proves, uh, for example, you will find an organization you can't use a USB stick. So, and um, if you manager, if it's your manager and it's your employee is enforcing the policy. Is that uh, you can have that collision where give me access and they can be able to exfiltrate data. You also find as a manager, they have access to more sensitive data, for example, the strategy of the company. And you find that they are the biggest insider thread that we have. And if you look through the reports online, you'll find that most of these people, insider threads who get to leak data information are usually in management and in high positions. Also statistics show that 48% was followed by 48% were contractors. Sometimes we don't uh, do our due diligence in understanding the protections and the controls our service providers and contractors have put in place. 
So you find their network has not been well protected. They don't have controls in place to protect data, to protect the information you're sharing with them. And then you find if they get compromised, they walk into our buildings, they interact with our servers, our data centers. There's no proper process defined on how they are handling the data, how they're coming into the building. So both technical, physical, is not defined. And you find that these are also a gap. So that Someone is speaking? Okay, I'll continue. Yes, others are regular employees. These are make 46% of the survey and uh, regular employees are usually someone like a receptionist who doesn't know what information to give and what not to give. Meaning training and awareness is very important for this category. And then we have 41% is caused by the IT admin and staff. So these are the techies who handle the controls. So you either they don't do the deployment or configuration as well, or they have they don't change the, they don't implement the nice, the best practices like password management, how, how long the password should be, how often it should be changed. You also find this admin staff, they create backdoors in those systems. They don't do assurance of the system. So they have bugs, which other people can be able to exploit. Also third party service providers had mentioned Likewise, also we have security pros danger in some of the applications that we get to use. Uh, this includes collaboration and communication apps, makes for 45% of insider threats. We also have cloud storage and file sharing tools, which make up 43% of the insider threats the organization is exposing itself to. Finance and accounting tools, which is 38%, and this is a critical one and social media 33 percent for social media is what do the staff get to share out there with the public is it uh, are they sharing our blueprint of the building we are in our evacuation plan so what kind of data are they sharing out there is it are they sharing numbers of employee are they sharing how we are seated in there are they taking pictures of fellow colleagues colleagues without their um consent and sharing it out there to the public. So for, uh, collaboration tools, things like Teams, Zooms, people get to exchange project information, they get to record uh, meetings, where do these records go, who is it shared with, so that, so those are the things that I, as management you should just think about, brainstorm about as long as you want to have flexibility and good user experience what how do you get to balance it with security and ensuring the privacy of everyone involved so this report also come amid a heightened awareness around insider threats if we saw last year there were so many high profile insider threats as companies like tesla twitter shopify and amazon also we have the 2013 breach at Target. I'm avoiding to mention some in my region, but they have been in also our local um, jurisdiction. So example of uh, insider threats that happened last year, there was one for insider trading at Amazon where a senior manager, I know many organizations have senior managers, of Amazon's task tax department was found to have been disclosing Amazon's confidential financial data to their family members so they could trade on it. So you find that the manager was accused of making $1.4 million from insider dealings. So you can imagine this is a senior manager who is implementing the controls, who has access to the financial data and is exfiltrating. So what controls do you put around these people? Also another example is Stradis healthcare attack where the ex-vice president who is a former employee also are insider threats or finance at the healthcare was accused of gaining unauthorized access to healthcare package shipping system. He modified deleted documents of the shipment of the personal protective equipment for the medics and the company. And this costed the company $5,000 to restore data and renew operations. And this was all during the COVID-19 pandemic. And you can imagine the delay that this caused and the consequences that had to come with it in terms of 
patients needing attention, the workers are not having the proper protective equipment to work. And probably that's why you would find most of our medics once in a while, they, look, they will complain. The media, you'll see they don't have protective gears. Probably someone has just had, has caused an inconvenience through an insider threat. The other one was the Twitter hack. You can all Google this on the website. They are there, public knowledge, where a hacker conducted a chain social engineering attack on Twitter employees, stole their confidential, gained access to the Twitter admin tool. Then the attacker posted these scams messages over 130 popular profiles and got $180,000 from Twitter users before the company could actually stop this breach. So you can see the, in the figures in terms of money, how much it's being lost just because of insider threats. Yes, there are also good uh, endings to this where like in Tesla and insider threat, a uh, Tesla employee rejected a bribe of uh, $1 million to install malware and cooperated with the FBI to help them investigate the case. So as much as we have insider threats, we also have insider, we have the threats, but also we have these employees in terms of the culture of the organization that you create, that they're able to be trusted, to be honest and transparent. And they also have channels where they can actually convey this information without being jeopardized. So what do you do with whistleblowers when they want to give information about that? Um, seen attack that is happening or an employee who's behaving suspiciously do you have these channels where they can report they remain anonymous and they will not actually be feel uh, intimidated that they report also i had told i had spoken earlier about the profiles of the insider threats so we have privileged users so privileged users usually are the administrators in the organization so these are particularly threatening since they hold all the keys to the organization's infrastructure and sensitive data. Also privileged users because of their high level of access, harmful activity by them will be difficult to detect. Most of them would erase, will just uh, clear their logs, especially if they are IT guru, and it will be very hard to come about what activity happened. So it is important to invest in uh, uh, things like threat hunting, just to once in a while do a hunt on the network to be able to pick out any suspicious activity that is happening with the network that you would not ex expect it to happen, or just to pick out any breach that may have happened six months down the line and you're not aware of. We also have regular employees as a profile on the insider threats who are not so dangerous compared to privileged users, but they still can harm an organization. For instance, they can misuse corporate data, they can install and authorize applications, they can send confidential emails to the wrong address, become a victim of phishing attacks. So with all these channels of exfiltrating data through a regular employee, what are the solutions which we'll discuss next. Also, we have third parties and temporary workers. You know now why people are given interns have a contract of three months, what information do they have? You have your vendors who have a contract of one year, two years, what information do they get to have? These people may not follow a cyber security rules and practices implemented in your organization, or they may violate them unknowingly. Because one, you cannot train some everyone in terms of budget, it's very OPEX, it's very high. So you find they might not know what are the policies and the rules and the practices, or they might know and decide just to violate them. Also, hackers can breach a third party vendor network with a low level security just to get to the protected perimeter. And when we say breaches, it's just not uh, in terms of technology online, it could be also physical, where someone could go to a vendor or a contractor. And so it's important when you're even hiring your service providers just to check the profiles of the employees who will be coming into your company, scrutinize them to ensure they are not implanted there for a specific motive just to get to your network through them. 
And uh, lastly, we have privileged business users and executives. These are the people in the C-level suits. These ones have access to the most confidential and sensitive information about an organization. Sensitive information could be the strategy of the company, could be a new product line you want to launch. So how do you, how do you ensure these people actually do not, it could be a report of an incident that has happened and uh, there's ongoing investigation. So how do you ensure that these people do not abuse their knowledge for this information uh, person, for personal gain or corporate or government espionage? Yes, so other causes of insider threats uh, could be just unsecure software where users uh, uh, download applications that are not secure into the laptops and you don't have the right protection to actually pick and block this. You don't have more active monitoring. You don't have a support uh, uh, section where users can actually go and be advised on which software to take to install. They cannot be advised in terms of, uh, to, they cannot be warned on these practice, practices. Also, there is no monitoring of such devices where a user is installing secure software. Also, other causes of insider threat could be unsecure devices. This is bringing your own device, IoT. So how do you get to monitor the devices, your employees, the third parties, the contract, any insider is bringing in and out of your organization? What information is there? How is it protected within the organization and out of the organization? And the most notorious one is email phishing, which needs continuous awareness for the employers so that they are able to detect the signs of a phishing email. Because everyone is susceptible to this. Do you do phishing campaigns so as to gauge the employees, so as to just gauge the level of awareness your employees have around it? so as to structure uh, targeted trainings for specific employees whom you feel they, are, they always fall victim to a campaign, yeah. So in terms of the frequency of uh, insider threat by the three profiles, you find employee and contractors has been going high. You find that this percentage has been going high at a rate of 8% to 10%. So it is year in, year out. The report for 2020, 2021, once it's out, you'll find that the number has definitely gone even higher to about 33%. So what do you then get to do? An example of a threat profile due to this. So there are threat profiles like employee or contractor negligence. So an employee is just negligent. So what culture do you have in place in your organization to ensure the people you employ actually treat the organization as their own business, not as an employee? Also, we have profiles of criminal and malicious insiders. These are just people who came into the organization with a motive. And then credential theft profile where people are trying to steal passwords, especially if they have access to it or if they are IT guru or hackers. An example of a credential theft profile was uh, back in 2009 when a company named Rocky was hacked. Uh, this would not have been much of a problem if they had then stole all their passwords and encrypted. So what technology do you have in place to encrypt user passwords? Most of the organizations have applications out there where users get to set their pins. How are these pins stored? What protections do you have in place? The goodness with all this, just as Safaricom, there's money security services. You don't have to have expertise inside. You can always reach out to uh, companies out there that offer these professional services to help you implement security, even at its basic. Yeah. So like I mentioned, there's a cost that comes with every breach that happens. And um, the cost of an insider threat in, has three components. There's the direct cost where money needed to detect, mitigate, investigate the breach has to be injected. So you need to have that budget in case there's a breach, then what are the resources that will be put in place? There's then there's, there's the indirect cost where the value of resources and employee time spent dealing with the incident. So 
how much time is the company spending to investigate this breach, to have to go to court, to answer to the Senate, to answer to a committee, what time, as much as it's not, it cannot be valued, it's actually time spent dealing with an incident than the business uh, objective. Also, there's a lost opportunity cost. These are losses in potential profits because of the attack. So you find if you have to shut out your company because there's a data leakage and your systems have to be upgraded and you cannot plan for all these, you find so there's losses that will be incurred because the business has been paralyzed. So you find in 2017, the cost was at uh, $8.76 million. 2019, it rose to 11.5. 11.45 million dollars 2020 is at 14.89 million dollars so as we wait for the reports for this year as we continually they come around july so as we wait for the report to come out we we'll definitely see a spike so what do you get to do to ensure that you do not fall successful so also reports shows that if we implement in good security then the average cost of uh, insider threats will definitely go low. So if you invest for in things like user behavior analytics, you'll save um, around $3.4 million. If you invest in user training and awareness, you'll save $3 million. And this is just an um, aggregated figure and average across the is not per organization because we understand some organization are tier one, some are tier three. So this is just a rough figure on the organizations that participated in the survey. So if you invest in strict third party vetting procedure, you will save $2.7 million. Privilege access management, which uh, is also called privilege, privilege identity management, you will save close to $3.1 million. If you invest in threat intelligence sharing and uh, threat hunting, you get to save $2.8 million. If you invest in incident response management, meaning you're monitoring, you're detecting and responding to incidents, you'll get to save $2.7 million. And also employee monitoring and surveillance, you get to save $2.6 million. Now, for employee monitoring and surveillance, this also, like I said, it has to be communicated. There has to be transparency. So as much as you want to save cost, make sure you're not infiltrating or infringing in someone's right to privacy. So after knowing all that, what do we do next? Some of the solutions I'll just uh, go through is uh, in-depth visibility. In-depth visibility is just uh, understanding your network what do you what are your assets or you get to know all your assets both online and offline especially if they have data both structured and the structured data and uh, where are they where are they located what are you storing what um, where are you storing the data that you're collecting how can you be able to get hold of it in case of a disaster recovery plan what are your what are your retention of data what are your data retention practices that you have and uh, technologies that you have, the mediums that you use. So according to surveys, and these are all over the news, 67% uh, of organizations say they are blind spots. Are one, their network blind spots are one of the biggest challenges they face when trying to protect their data. So you are running an organization, you don't know how many laptops you have for the end users, you don't know how many servers you have, you don't know where they are located, what information they've been gathering. Also, according to survey, it is that many companies, almost 40% of them, lack a fully developed comprehensive program of process to pinpoint, notify, and respond to a security breach. So most people don't have incident management process in place. They don't know who gets to communicate to the media Oh, is it the CEO? Is it the chairman? Is it the analyst? Are the are the support? Is it the support desk? So, who gives this information there? Who talks to the news? What information do they get to share? Also, how do you get to monitor and actually say it is not an insider threat? It is actually an outsider. It has come for a third party. How is the whole 
investigation process? How also is the reporting? Do you have reports? Do you have debriefs of uh, how the incident is being handled? Also, we have 75% of organizations agree that they need to improve their network visibility. And uh, you can never say you're done because the more you grow as a company, the more there's a new customer today on the 28th, there'll be a new customer on the 29th. So your visibility gets to increase. You get to purchase new software and technology solutions. So most of them say that they need to improve their visibility to better enable network security. And, but first it starts with understanding what is it and how can it be done. So this means that there has to be a team dedicated in understanding the whole program around visibility. Also for organizations, when you're developing a uh, visibility program, you need to have a sponsor. You need to assign an owner. You have to identify the custodians of the different assets. You have to have representatives within the committee who will be responsible for the different sections and the different custodians will be reporting to them. So you just don't start a program. There's always learnings which you can do from your peers who've already done it. Also, statistics show 50% uh, uh, of organizations have inadequate information to identify potential threats. 40% of them also don't have a comprehensive program, which I mentioned that you just need to learn with your peers what they have done so that you don't also try to reinvent the wheel, especially if you're in the same vertical, have those benchmarking programs ongoing, visit the CEOs when you're networking, just get to understand what the other organization do so as to shorten your journey, especially in this era where the lawsuits and the fines may start coming. So you want to be very proactive because it could help you just to show that you practice due care and due diligence. Yes. So organizations should also take initiative to develop a regulatory compliance framework, use uh, global and local laws as baselines to develop a framework. You don't have to come with a framework from the blues. There is the GDPR, which helped Kenya develop its Data Protection Act. So as an organization, use those baseline to develop a framework. And when I say a framework, this is where you decide what is that. You define all those data privacy, security protection. You define what is data quality. You define things like data classification. How, are the data, how is the data indexed? How do you hide that data? Also, you get to define things like the... Uh, the officers will be responsible, the committee which will be responsible, who gets to communicate to the public, who gets to communi send communication internally within the organization, such like things. So, uh, Fidesz, excuse me, Fidesz, you have uh, three minutes left. Yeah. All right. So, another solution would be to invest in information protection solutions and uh, develop a process around it. So there you get to define your purpose of the classification, the scope, what do you want covered. You also need to discover everything that you have defined in the scope, define the sensitivity levels. Another thing also you need to, you can incorporate is uh, data management policies, things like data exfiltration policies, where employees are prompted to are prompted before they get to exfiltrate data, copy files, so that they can be able to be given permission, be blocked, stopped, or uh, be monitored. Um, another thing is uh, anti-phishing protection. This is usually major, especially because people, it keeps evolving with time, so it's important that the phishing protection is put in place. Awareness and training around it is also revamped. Uh, there are playbooks for anti-phishing. This is just a sample one. When do you know it's a phishing so that you block? When do you get to allow the link to go through? Uh, other policies you can put in place are for removable drives, especially now that people are working from home, so that when they get this prompt, obviously no one would want to know they are being monitored or they have been uh, flagged. So it's important that you have this in place, file protection, how do you protect files that are sensitive? Who gets? Who do you get to share those files with? 
who in the recipient is not allowed to receive it so that if they receive, they can actually not open. And to finish, um, I think I have spoken a lot and I see my time is coming to an end. But as I finish, some other things that organizations should take into perspective is transparency, just to ensure that your employees know how their data is being handled. They know, for example, if it's a work application, if you're an organization, are you tracking their location? Are you tracking their browsing habits? Keep them aware so that you don't have this, uh, you don't have a pushback from employees not wanting to incorporate these applications and these solutions you're putting in place. Also invest in technology. Majority have regulatory and uh, audit frameworks inbuilt into the solutions. So use uh, software as an enabler, technology as an enabler. You can implement things like access control, encryption, pseudomization, all of it. And then training and awareness is the most basic from your physical to logical security ensure this training and awareness, yes. And finally, what do we get to see as organizations? Things to look out for are decisions on advocacy, data monetization. Will it be that as a customer, as an employee, when you're using my data, you're sharing my data, you'll pay me. And as a company, how do you also monetize the data you have? What protections are in place? Also other things to look out for as a public organizations are the new roles that are coming up. These days, CISOs are compulsories in the financial center, so sector that the data privacy practitioners would also become active like cybersecurity just proud out in the few years. Also, future trends are the roles of data commissioner, where we just get to understand the data commissioner has many roles. Some would include publishing white lists of safe regions to transfer data to. So if you're working with a supplier or a vendor who is in, for example, China or the US, what are the protections that they put in place? Have they been white listed? Can you transact with them or not? Also, we'll see an increase in diplomatic dialogue. So be on the lookout, follow the conversations. The major one will be lawsuits and big fines. We're just waiting for one person to submit a lawsuit. Then we get the rest of us follow suit. And for as organizations, it's important, even as our employees, we be transparent so that we don't have to be sued for some of the activities we are doing internally that infringe on data privacy. And also for the employees, when you're interacting with the data within the organization, also you might be sued. So it's a two-way traffic. Another thing also as a trend is innovations on uh, how just to be able to deal with the data privacy and how to protect the data. Things like big data, AI, IoT, how do we then secure IoT especially? Then there are new laws. For example, US, Europe, Asia, Kenya, we had ours last year. How then do we define the code of conduct by benchmarking the principles on data protection across all these new laws? Also, there'll be increased popularity, popularity in risk quantification solutions. So it's important that you have a risk management team section or advisor or provider who can just guide you in identifying the risks so that you have objectives and this risk are feed into your strategy and your objectives. So that as you're looking to grow all these things around data privacy and protection, you've identified the risk and you're securing yourself. Also device management, how then do you get to manage devices that you have given your employees and those that the employees own personally, but all these devices have uh, sensitive data. So how do you get to manage your devices? Remember, you don't have to have the solution to all these. You can always reach out to providers and professionals who offer this expertise. And also remember, as you're reaching out to them, your terms of reference and your contract should make sure have covered all bases so that you don't suffer any breach and you are the one answering to it. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, um, Fides. Um, I know we have, we have one question. Have a question. If you mind. Yes, yes, listen, go ahead. 
Yes, actually, we we uh, we have seen a number of telecom companies mm -hmm. um, having little troubles when they uh, they join hands with the external and the insider from the telecom. Then they start sharing information of customers, mm -hmm. and later on, those people start receiving calls. Uh, and, 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 and end up losing money and so on and so on. So how do you feel uh, talk about these kinds of incidents that really troubles telecommunication companies? Reminds me as well of seeing swapping. Thank you for that question. So there are many bases to cover this. One, as a telco, we started with our visibility product program just to understand the kind of information that is out there. So we both, we have offline data, which is kind of tricky to manage. So those are the things we get to look at the offline data where you actually have forms where people fill their numbers, they transact on M-Pesa, where do these books that they are filled their data go to, how is it managed and being secure. So we are looking to transition into a fully digital platform where this information will not be offline and if it is offline it is protected also awareness to the public is something that we take with a deep concern where we involve in uh, public participation doing uh, advertisements on social media on the television broadcast on radio just to ensure the customers knows the basic of protecting themselves there's usually much we can do in terms of enforcement because that's a juris that's a responsibility that falls under law enforcement but in terms of what we can do is awareness and training of our users on how to protect themselves also in terms of ensuring the data we are collecting offline and online is protected and trying to digitize everything so that nothing is left on paper on hard copy also another thing is taking things like biometric voice recognition when you want to be recognized so that you cannot change phone numbers giving them or giving them the like and the phone number of a company that they should be expecting calls to we send text messages out there. You can send text messages out there to your customers on a predefined frequency on just a, a creating awareness around how to be secure and not be conned. Also, we have systems in place where we flag numbers that are seen to participate in fraud. So if a number is seen to do transactions that is abnormal on a specific on a short duration or a specific duration then it gets flagged and actually that we progress this to the law enforcement so there's much that is being done and i can tell you it's not done by only a cyber security team there are so many sections that get to involve there's the incident response team there's the risk team they are the sales team that go out there to sell our products the marketing team so we all have to combine forces and that's why i say it's important to do benchmarking with your peers just to understand what they are doing and there's just so much yes thank you okay thank you but actually, um i i would like to use this opportunity to congratulate safaricom safaricom you're doing a very great job when it comes to awareness i've seen those messages pinyako pesayako and so on a lot of messages that are trying to uh to to sensitize people to be aware of these uh, threats that we have, cyber threats. But then unfortunately, um, a Safaricom can be doing very good job, but then you don't share intelligence and, uh, uh, and, and information with colleagues, other telecom companies. So why, what is the problem here? Why do you find it difficult to share intelligence and information about how you can protect customers' data, customers' money, customers' whatever, and um, it end up you are doing better, but other people are doing are not doing the way you are doing. Why don't you share this information with others? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I'll speak for myself, not on behalf of the organization. I'll speak from what I've seen as I've been a member of this organization for five years. So one thing you'd understand that uh, knowledge transfer, knowledge sharing, is it's a two-way traffic. So both parties have to be comfortable sharing with each other. And I know at Safaricom, we do share this information both locally and globally with other organizations. So unless it's an in-depth information, that will be beyond me 
to explain. But you'd find, for example, we have a ladies, uh, she has team where we share information. We have uh, groups on WhatsApp where we share data across companies, individuals not from the same organization. So unless what you're stating is more of a C4, a classified information that is needed, then that's beyond me to explain. But in terms of basic information sharing on what we are doing, we actually do invite even customers, other organization to visit our premise, to, do, to see what we are doing at cybersecurity, to see what we are doing in the network operations center. So that platform is there. But now when it comes to the details, that will be beyond me. Not about details, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that, um, you know, we, when we come to resolving challenges, when it comes to cybersecurity, we yeah. have the story of collaboration. Yeah. Making sure that Safaricom, if you fall victim today, you should yeah. not allow Telecom tomorrow to fall victims of the same attack. You should yes. not allow Tigo, for example, Hal uh, mm -hmm. Hotel, KTCL, and the rest to mm -hmm. fall victim of a similar attack. Meaning you have to share that knowledge. What happened? How others, Telecom com uh, companies, can protect themselves from falling victims? Something like that. So these are the things that I've been and trying to understand why is it not happening? Why people are not uh, telecommunication companies, uh, uh, bank, but specifically telecommunication companies are not doing these kind of things. As a result, you find one is doing good, but others are keeping falling victims. And one can fall victim today with the same attack. And the next time the other telecommunication company fall victim with a very similar attack. So why this is happening? Why can't you find a, a common ground where you, uh, you talk, you have, for example, way that you can share your, your, your intelligence, you can share your, 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 your information so that throughout the telecommunication company, you end up having a, a, a basic way of protecting customers' data, customers' money, and so, and, and so on. Thank you, Yusuf. Uh, so, so like I mentioned earlier, we actually do uh, peer knowledge transfer, peer sharing, but uh, like you said, uh, I can give you information. What you do with it, it's up to you. So I think it's prudent also on our, it will be overstepping on our end to actually force them to enforce some of the recommendations we give them. So each organization, like Yusuf has proposed, when you do a benchmarking, when there's an incident and the recommendations that they have been given, just do your prudent care, your prudent diligence, and implement. Otherwise, as Safaricom, the, mo the, the most we can do is share the information. But when it comes to enforcement, then the data protection, com the data commissioner can assist with that. Mm -hmm.